there's there was always rumors like that, like, oh, look at these crazy parents. They're trying to live their dreams through their daughter and they're forcing her. Because my dad was like, please stop climbing with them. Please stop, rest, rest. Like he's someone very big who, you know, did big things and then I'm just hanging around. <laughs> Welcome to the season two kickoff of the That's Not Real Climbing podcast. I'm your host, Jenny, and I'm super excited to introduce my guest for today, Stasha Gayo. This is super special to me because she has been my favorite climber on the circuit, so I'm so happy to have gotten the chance to talk to her in season two. For those who aren't familiar, Stasha is a boulder and lead climber, more of a boulder from Serbia, who has been competing in international cups since 2011 as a youth climber. In this episode, we'll learn about Serbian funding in the sport and OQS. We'll get a glimpse into what bouldering isolation is like, hear some tales from the commentary booth, and hear her reflect on the 2023 season. Hope you enjoy this episode with Stasha. All right. Yeah, we can just get right into it then. How are you doing today? Yeah, uh, pretty well. Doing a lot of trainings, uh, going from another to the other, to like one to the other session, uh, visiting different gyms. So yeah, it's, it's good. You just moved to a new location recently? Uh, I mean, I've been in Munich for the last four years or four years and a few months, but I've changed a flat here. Oh, okay. Okay. So not too bad. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Well, it was just the holidays. Um, New Year's is coming up. Do you have any New Year's plans? Um, actually, yeah, tomorrow morning I'm flying to Stockholm where my sister lives. So I'm going to spend uh, New Year's Eve with my sister and her family. Okay, exciting. Do you do like New Year's resolutions by any chance? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> Never, really. <laughs> well, anyways, like, <laughs> they're, they're kind of pointless, but um, I don't know. I no. Maybe I did do them when I was a teenager, but totally not anymore. It's not. Mm. If there's a resolution, it can come at any point. So. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, I don't think I have any either. I was wondering if I should make some because I ask everybody and then they ask me back and I'm like, oh, I don't have any. <laughs> I didn't think of any. Um, I was wondering if I should, though. Do you have like year long goals that you think of? Well, for my year, technically, it's not like a calendar year. I see it more as the season year, like early related to the competition season. So like my new year has already begun with the winter training and started like end of November. Um, so I'm already in 2024. It's like 2020 is basically just some paper. So, yeah, like after the season ends and when the new one begins, you kind of see what you want to get better at, which new skills do you want to learn. <clears throat> I don't know. I recently go back to handstands a little bit. So maybe that's something I'd like to um, get a little bit better at uh, besides all the climbing stuff. <laughs> but yeah, it's like you set yourself some goals. Um, obviously, my main goal is to qualify for Olympics. And then there's like smaller goals on the way there. So, um, yeah, so I look at it a bit differently, but yeah, new resolutions, I don't know. My whole life is at this point in time revolving purely around climbing, so it's uh, all basically related to that. And handstands, I guess. Yeah, that, that will help me get my shoulders a bit strong. <laughs> also related to climbing, therefore... Yeah. No, actually, I recently watched a video that inspired me to want to do handstands, but uh, I I have never been able to do one, so I don't I don't think that's gonna pan me out. Me neither. I, yeah. Oh. Me neither. Wait, I I've thought never you... been able to do a full one. No. Oh, come on. <laughs> I mean, I. What I do is I just throw myself up against the wall, and then I try to balance it. I feel like I'm doing everything wrong. Firstly, I'm so uncoordinated upside down. Like I don't know where my legs are, where my head is. Um, <laughs> and, and then that thus comes the balance as well. Um, so yeah, um, there was a point in time where I was 
doing my bachelor's and where I did handstands and the break between like study in chunks of like a couple of like hours maybe. And then I'll just do a few handstands and then continue um, studying. And I came to a point where I could like lift off the door or the wall for 10, 20 seconds. But I haven't really done it since. So now I'm back at it again. I feel like my knee, my shoulders need a lot of stability. So that's one of the things to improve it, I guess. Yeah, maybe I should try it out. And then I've seen those videos where they do, I guess, like a cartwheel on the boulder. Oh. I might have those. If those show up this year. Oh, I really hope it never comes to the world. Cause <laughs> I mean, I can do cartwheels. Also, an interesting thing that I've realized is that my whole life, I've been doing cartwheels on one side only. So right hand first, the left hand. And then I realized, oh, I don't think I've ever tried the other side. And then I tried it and it was horrible. It was like, you know, children trying to learn it for the first time and it was horribly wrong. So then I practice that. It's still a bit clumsy, but I can do it now on the other side too. It's just weird. It's like so unnatural. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, pretty impressive, I think. I um I have never managed to either. So good for you. <laughs> good for you. Do cartwheels first and then then hence I think it's easier. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. I yeah, you know, my shoulders, I can't take it right now. Maybe later. I can totally get that. <laughs> All right, so we can get right into it. Um, first, do you want to just give a brief overview of your climbing career, I guess, and um, mm -hmm. like how you started climbing, when you started competing, all that good stuff. Um, I'd say I started competing when I was, I mean, how old was I? Even like seven years old, perhaps. Um, I usually take it like approximately the age of like the year 2004 because this is the first time I went to an international competition. It was in Bulgaria in Veliko Trnovo, but I was, yeah, six or seven years old. Um, so it wasn't very successful nor serious, I'd say, but this is around the time where I pretty regularly did like these kids national co comps and tried like I competed as, as much as I could also because um <clears throat> my parents couldn't always get like my grandma we one or the other one to babysit um when they um took their club and the other members to competitions so it's a certain point where I could also technically climb or do something there then they'd take me just with them um, so <laughs> I was a uh, very, hmm, let's say an angry little person who was the youngest in the category and was angry because she couldn't win. <laughs> yeah. So I was basically super competitive from the very beginning, like, oh, I want to win. But you're like half the size of everyone else. I was like, I don't care. I want to win. <laughs> What's the older, um, the older end of that range for the youngest category uh, it depends like it really depended on um competition to competition but sometimes it's like um eight years old and younger that was usually, and then i don't know they probably didn't let kids that are younger than five compete but <laughs> obviously <laughs> but i think there was one call where i was two years younger than the winner uh but yeah um, so that went on and I got better and better, started eventually winning, satisfying my, uh, well, competitive needs, um, that having given bigger balls, I climbed a lot outdoors because we have a family house in a um, climbing area in Serbia. It's called the Alashlica. It's, um, close to the city of Niš where I was born. <clears throat> so yeah, I spent basically, I think once with twice a week um, rock climbing. Mm, I think that really improved my, my technique because kind of rock forces you to find solutions technically most of the time when it's like slab or vertical. So I think that played a big role in my climbing development and developing my own style. 
And at the age of 12, I think it was 12, but it should be as long as my memory holds. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. But at the age of 12, I was either the younger, or the youngest female or maybe the youngest ever to do an 8B root. So maybe my stats were wrong, but there was something like this. Um, at the time, that was a big thing to do, like an 8B root, um, red point. Yeah, as a 12-year-old person was pretty big deal. Nowadays, kids do much higher grades. They do 9As at that age. Already, so. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different world now, but um, yeah. So I shifted from like kids comps to um, youth competitions, which are way more official. It's under the IFSC. And uh, yeah, I've won quite a lot of medals there. Um, and I basically crowned, so to say, uh, my junior years with basically winning every competition within two years, except the last world championship where I got seven. But I, the year before in Arco 20, 2015, I, I won the World Youth Championships there in bouldering and in combined. Um, so, well, yeah, that was the first time I fulfilled like one of my really, really big goals to become world champion. And uh, about that time, I started shifting already towards the senior categories, making my first finals. Um, which then led me to now having three uh, world championship bronze medals. <laughs> and uh, yeah, World Cup medals, um, all of them bronze so far. Uh, I was very close to the silver one this year, but uh, ah, made a bit too many attempts. Which one was that again? Uh... Why, Brixen, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Brixen. Yeah, I was just gonna quickly take my stats out because I'm just a bit confused <laughs> if I'm if I'm getting my numbers right. I'm not really sure, but let's see. How often do you check those? Um, not that often, actually. Just when I need something. Yeah, okay, three world championship. Is it one, two? No, two bronze wins. Oh, but very confusing world championship. Innsbruck third, and then Moscow third. Yeah, okay, that's about it. Yeah, um, correct. There are two in the championship and then another three in the World Cups. Um, yeah, I also won the European Championship in, in Munich, in bouldering in 2017. And this was like the most, I think also the highlight of my career so far because it was a super final, which really, really rarely happens. And... Um, it was a funny comp because um, they couldn't find an organizer that year for uh, the European Championship. So they had to organize it within a World Cup. So the best idea they could come up with, the organizers at the IFSC at the time, was to um, have the semifinals results define the European Championship. But what happened was that Janja Gambers and I had the exact same score in, in semifinals. So we shared the first place. And there was no count back because it was two groups. Um, so they were like, okay, we need to crown a champion somehow. How are we going to do it? Well, in this particular case, you have to go with the super final. And I've never been in an actual like international level super final before. <laughs> that, that happened only once before. Um, so they gave us one of the men's semifinal bowlers. I don't know if they changed it a bit. Maybe slightly tweaked it but um in this format every move counts so there's no classic start they there's no like four points they just told us well you can start however you like uh and yeah then every move counts so one climber goes one attempt the other climber is behind the wall then the other day then we switch like i go behind the wall um, Yanya comes out and then if Yanya is climbs um, lower than me I win if, cli if Yanya climbs higher than me she wins but there was a massive jump um, already like second move so we both fell on it 
like two rounds in. On the third round, I think, I managed to stick the dino. And then I did two more moves and the plus. And then it was like, well, either Yanya falls on the, the jump again and I win, or she does the jump and then we see how far she gets. But then she fell on the jump and technically then I won. And before that, I thought when I heard that the system was counting every move and Yanya was already then way, way better at lead climbing and endurance. At that time, I didn't even compete in lead as far as I can remember. Not that much at all. So I thought, oh, she's going to get me immediately. She has more endurance than me. If this is like by the number of moves, she probably wins. But then, yeah, then it was a jump. And that was the play advantage at night. It was a super intense competition. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I've actually seen it. Um, it's I'm assuming it's online somewhere that we could. It is watch. online. I think yeah, there is like a short uh, review of it, um, but also some slow mo's. It's on YouTube. Yeah. Okay, I'll find it. I'll link it, and we can all watch and see the highlight of your career. But going back to um, you growing up amongst climbing. Yeah, you come from a family of climbers, um, and I was wondering what it's like growing up in that environment, because I think a lot of people who get into climbing just like recently got into climbing, and so they have no idea what it's like growing up in that kind of environment. Um, and I was wondering if you kind of ever felt like you were forced into climbing or competing, because I think your parents also did competitions. Um and I think a lot of people who grow up being forced to do certain activities kind of grow to resent it. So yeah, I was one of the experience with that. Well, I'm still not resenting it, I think. So uh, that's a good sign. Uh, <laughs> um, so my mom competed a lot. She was doing all the national and Balkan championships and she was third, I think, or even the Balkan champion at the time. Yeah, yeah. And um, so... There was like this whole competition vibe and outdoors vibe in my family. My father is a, an alpinist. He went to the Himalayas, um, to ants, to, he was like a mountain guide uh, all over the world. And he also basically founded this climbing club uh, in our town um, and bolted some uh, some roots um, in, the, in this climbing area where I lived in. Um, so yeah, it was a, a whole basically climbing environment. Um, I was playing with the gear when I was a kid, uh, when I was really, really like a toddler. Um, and then I saw everyone basically as a child, you, you copy what everyone else is doing, everyone's climbing, you're like, I don't want to climb. And then I convinced them to put a top rope for me, or rather convinced them to just tie me up. What did I know what the top rope was back then? Uh, and then if it were too hard for me, then I would cry because, oh, I cannot climb or I'm scared of the height or, <laughs> you know, the classic uh, toddler tantrums. Um, but yeah, in, as I was getting more and more into it, I had phases where I didn't want to climb at all. I would just play around and not be bothered. And there were periods where I really wanted to like reach the top as many times as I could. Uh, but as how it developed to me getting into actual competition climbing was more that we started traveling and uh, we went to Slovenia, often to Bulgaria, also to Austria, where I had a chance to compete with um, kids my age. And um, I was making really, really good progress, like year by year, season by season. We went on training camps all over the, all over Europe or Balkans also. Um, and I was improving and then I slowly started getting to the podium and um, getting really psyched to train. So we saw that, I mean, rather my parents saw that I have quite a potential. So they said it uh, would be a pity to waste it. So we basically put everything into training and traveling and going to competitions and basically for them also to develop in their coaching as well as me developing in my climbing and um, and training as well. Um, if I was forced to climb, yeah, on occasions, probably, sure. Uh, but it's just because I was a child with no discipline at the time, no like, sense of discipline and planning. 
like what does a 10 year old know or a 12 year old know how often they need to train and what they need to do so these things are normal it's not it just wasn't tortured like really far away from that it was just like well yeah today we're gonna go outdoor climbing you know oh no i don't want to <laughs> well we're going so pack your stuff and go um and it this is how i learned the discipline and because there were no other coaches well my mom and dad had to do it uh to teach me how how this process training process works um and yeah, if your parents or your coaches, there is like hmm, this continuum and not like a clear line between coaches and parents, you know, it like intertwines a lot. So this part, like the, the private part gets a little bit more difficult um, to to handle at times. But, you know, when there is no one else to show you that, like, what, what are you going to do? You know, this is what you have and this is the activity you chose and you like and you enjoy doing. So... Yeah, sure. Sometimes it's going to be hard, but it's not the end of the world, you know. Um, I wasn't living my parents' expectations or whatever. You know, there's there was always rumors like that, like, oh, look at these crazy parents. They're trying to live their dreams through their daughter, and they're forcing her. Like, really, I hated when people made those comments because it's just it's like the easiest thing to say, you know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, poor thing. I mean, <laughs> come on. Okay, um, debunking that yeah. myth right here. Yeah, I, I mean, sometimes like, yeah, sure. On a few occasions, you're going to make your child cry or that child is not going to want to go to training. But also nowadays, sometimes I don't want to go to training. I'm like, oh, everything hurts. I just want to stay at home. But then I have to kick myself and, and go. And I still do that to myself. You know, someone's got to do it. And if you want to be successful... Um, and if you want to improve, that's sometimes it's, yeah, this discomfort that you have to deal with, which I think is absolutely natural and normal. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think my climbing up upbringing and well, my general upbringing was great. And I think my parents did a really great job into, in teaching me, um, what matters, how to be disciplined, how to work smartly and too hard, not over training. Um, I think I learned everything. Okay, good to know. Good to know that you weren't forced into anything you didn't want to do. Um, yeah, I think that makes sense because even if your parents force you to do something, you also personally have to enjoy it and put in the work to actually get good enough at it. Like, there are definitely things I was forced to do that I didn't like doing. And I still never ended up getting good at it because I didn't like it. So, yeah, that's that's a pity. Yeah, that's that's it's sad to see when someone's forced into something, you know, and you can see that it's an absolute torture. But it, these things happen, and sometimes for parents, it's also hard to know which is the sport for their child. Um, you know, their parents that send their child from one sport to the other. They try five different sports within a year and then they end up not liking anything. But um, you have to try to guide them somehow and then maybe yeah, you make a mistake and that's not it. But in my case, of course, I liked a lot of other sports. I wanted to play football and uh, <laughs> I did play it in school a lot. But uh, it didn't go with climbing. Climbing was a priority then. We decided once we started really sacrificing a lot and giving everything in for the competitions. And then suddenly I start getting really good in football and people want to get me in their clubs and whatever to play, I don't know, what leagues, teenager leagues. And then my dad just said, nope, no football. She needs to go to the competitions. She'll get injured. They're, they'll break her legs. <laughs> I'm not allowing it. So yeah, the school league was the maximum I, I uh, got to in football. Yeah, makes sense. And I think people just kind of, people want to like make up that story because it makes it, it makes things more interesting. You know, it makes it a bit more like, oh, there's like a tough, a tough upbringing there. It would be interesting. Yeah, that's, that's the right way to go. Nah. 
Let's go into your World Cup experience. Um, another thing that viewers don't know a lot about, people always want to know what's going on behind the scenes in isolation and just what's going on in your mind as you're competing. Um, and I think Matt Groom also really wants to know what goes on behind the scenes in isolation. So um, this is something he wanted me to discuss, I think. Um, so what is it like in isolation? What do you do? What do other athletes do? In isolation, you spend, well, between two hours and then I guess the upper limit doesn't exist, but technically some people stay in for about four hours sometimes or longer if they're more competitors, but it all comes down to the ranking and the starting list. So if your ranking is good in bouldering, um, you start within the first. So... And the people without the ranking are then randomly sorted in the bottom half. Um, and then, yeah, someone has to start last. And therefore, we have this isolation, which hmm, some people are starting to be more and more against it. And there were some changes trying to be made to include flash also into bouldering, like it's in lead, where we don't have ISO in lead. We watch each other, we have the demonstrations, and then the start list is randomized. But I'm also amongst those old school people who really like the isolation and I don't want to give it up. And I mean, there are quite a few people who still share this old school sort of say, opinion, but there have been more and more suggestions to try to switch to the flash format. And it's already been done on the European Cups and the Youth Cups, but it brings a lot of other organizational problems uh, and also excludes this problem solving this which is quite crucial in bouldering it's like in lead it is not as pronounced as it is in boulder sometimes that's the main trick to solve a boulder so although yeah it is just the qualifying round but anyways let not me not bother you with this topic but yeah isolation is basically a space where you have no information about the outside world. So you had no idea who did what, what are the results, what are the boulders. You know nothing. And there you can warm up. There is a warm-up wall. Since Corona, there are also like these pull-up bars or like just bars where we can hang our hangboards to warm up if there's no already provided fingerboards. Um, so what happens is, for example, my routine is to start stretching um, and doing mobility exercises two hours before the start, or like two hours, 10 minutes, perhaps. So I do that for around 30 to 40 minutes. In between, I also start warming up my fingers on the fingerboard. But this mostly consists of yoga elements with classic warm up uh, exercises. Uh, some elastic band exercises as well. And then after those 30 to 40 minutes, I start going onto the wall with slow um, traversing, big holds, slow start basically. And then starting with defining some boulders um, until you, like basically just as if it were a training session where you warm up and you start gradually from easier to harder poles. Um, and in these like remaining hour and a half, I take usually two rests of like 10 to 15 minutes uh, in between so that I don't get too tired. Um, and then the rest is just saving your skin and uh, trying to do moves and boulders that include as many different elements that could appear in the competition as possible. So you would try toggle catch, um, paddle, dinos, high step, balancing, like anything that you can try that you think is most likely to be on the comp and that gives you like a general um, wide range to warm up. So this is what, what we do. Sometimes we join like in small groups of different people that do stuff together from different nations as well, uh, or it's teams separately, like... Thankfully, in climbing, people are still open to like join in 
uh, or to let you join them. So for example, if let's say a Korean hall coach has a really cool boulder that I want to try and I don't know all the details and I can ask them, hey, can you please tell me how this boulder went or can I join you in on this boulder? Can you explain it to me? And like almost all the time, people are very happy to welcome you in their boulder and be like, yes, yeah, sure. Here's the start. You go there, 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 there. We're trying to do this and this. And if there's like eliminates or like a specific move you want to do, then they explain that too. So this is nice, like bouldering. It's sometimes it looks also like a little session. <laughs> um, but I also heard that it's more pronounced in the men's warm up that they give each other such hard boulders that they already start the competition in the ISO. And apparently this happens way more often with men and that the coaches try to like pull them back. And this is also like an old trick of maybe more experienced climbers when the new young guns come in, like 16, 17 year olds, like the strong ones that they want to show off and they just give them like something really hard all the time. <laughs> and like to basically tire them out or to make them, yeah, they make them feel good, but then they get a bit tired. And uh, strategy. Yeah, the, the more experienced waters don't care so much about the warm-up, really, or how they perform on the warm-up. There's not much ego involved in that. But yeah, and females, I think this was done to me once. <laughs> <laughs> because my dad was like, please stop climbing with them. Please stop, rest, rest. It's like, no, I have to do this another boulder and, and this boulder, and I need to do this jump. And uh, all that old crew was like, hey, Stasha, come over, let us show you another one. Oh, wow. And of course, my performance on the competition itself was horrible. Oh, <laughs> even though I was great in the war. Have you yeah. ever paid it forward and done that to someone? No. <laughs> Not that you're willing to admit. No, no. <laughs> no, I haven't, I haven't done that. Um, but yeah, and then... When it's about 15 to, it's like 10 to 15 minutes before your start, they usually take you out of the isolation zone and you go to the transit zone behind the boulder. So basically around 20 minutes before your start, you should like do your last toilet run, pack your snacks, see, sort like what you need immediately with you, climbing shoes, another pair of shoes, liquid chalk, fan, snacks, stuff like this, water, other liquids. Um, and then like I try to sort things out and you get some boxes where you can sort uh, the bags and the shoes and everything uh, so yeah you give yourself also a little rest of those like 20 minutes before the start um, and then it goes then behind the wall yeah it's two groups in the qualities and semifinals it's just one group and you have the chairs it's basically just a chair maybe a water dispenser um and your box with your stuff and all the people are like basically coming in and returning to the same place so you can see who came back earlier who's in which boulder you can try to figure out calculate or see which chair they're on or something like this so this is the place where you start getting some information in um but it's just basically from behavior it's either the crowd uh like cheering and then the moderator will probably say the name of the person who's climbing something and then you can figure out oh yeah okay this boulder is to be done quickly this one's hard you can see the pattern of what's going on when you're when you arrive behind the wall but that's it like we're not allowed any devices um electronic devices nothing that can have an internet or bluetooth connection so no Nothing with a wireless connection. So smart watches, headphones have to be wired. You need to have um, this MP3 player without any connections possible. Um, yeah, everyone leaves all the electronic devices in like a bag at the entrance of the ISO. And then the coaches or well, whoever picks it up at the exit, you, what your exit, the isolation conditions. Yeah. And so do you prefer to listen to the crowd noise from ISO or are you one of those people who wants to just zone out and not know what's going on? Depends. So mostly, mostly it's pretty upsetting, I think. I don't like it. So I like to pump up my volume 
as much so that I don't hear the moderator. Like I can probably hear the crowd, but I don't want to hear the moderator and which name. Sometimes it's easier for me not to know literally anything or I just close my eyes and try not to see who came back when so that I go without any expectations, without any pressure, just blank, just go in and climb. Sometimes I like to know what's going on so that I can be better prepared. It depends what kind of mood I'm in that day. If, if I'm more nervous, I'd like to know less. But if I'm really hyped up and if that crowd makes me even more motivated, then I'll probably just listen to each other. Hmm. Okay. And how do you feel between qualies versus semis versus finals? Um, I guess like physically and emotionally. <laughs> That's that's a very good question because there is a massive difference between the rounds. So in quality, in quality I go a bit more chilled in um, because I almost always make semifinals. So I, I trust my ability. Um, it's been only a few occasions that I haven't made semis. Um, so I go a little bit more tactical. If I see it's going too well, I try to do a couple of attempts more so that I'm not really first but that my rank is a little bit lower so I don't have to start last I hate starting last so if I see that I'm doing a little bit too well then I just try to add on attempts so my chances of not winning the round are better um I like it's super satisfying when you win a round don't get me wrong but then you regret it the next day when the holes are yeah, much, much dirtier, but sometimes you can't control it, really. If you've played too much with this tactics game, you can be out very easily. So, qualies is a little bit more chilled because the boulders are not so brutal, usually. And then semifinals, it's a fight to death. I think semifinals are usually the hardest, physically the hardest round. Mm, yeah. Because this is where you have to sort the field from 20 to 6 in Boldly. And uh, it's a very tough thing to do. And because finals, you'd think finals might be the hardest, but for finals, people usually don't have much skin left and everyone's tired. So um, technically, yeah, it depends, of course, comp to comp. But finals is more a show-off. Um, they want more boulders for TV. They need at least two ballers top, at least one top by everyone or like almost everyone. So now this is like TV tactics, uh, which I, I don't like. Nobody likes it, but they, it makes the finals shorter. The audience also, likes it. Yeah, the audience likes it and it makes it more based on attempts than actual number of tops, usually. Like not, depends, of course. But semifinals is the most stressful and the toughest. Toughest. Because it, it doesn't let you breathe, really. It's four boulders, really tough, really tough boulders with, yeah, two parts in, in each boulder. It's like if you do the first part and you get the zone, the top is usually not granted. Like, you can still mess it up. So, in qualities, you try to save your skin so you have perfect skin for semis. And then in semis, you try to give your best so you can make the finals because this is the hardest part, basically, make and then in finals, there's so many different factors that can play along. Like if it's your style, um, your girl's a bit more tired. Um, this is also like this long-term endurance thing or like power endurance. How long can you push? Mm -hmm. So it's, the three rounds are completely different from each other. Also, I think the finals are pretty boring when it comes to the waiting time because it's no rotations. It's four minutes and then you wait until your next round and then there's also commercial breaks so yeah you would wait for 20 minutes plus extra two to three minutes between climbers and um, commercial breaks and stuff of course if everyone flashes it goes faster but I always found it like really boring and like oh, I need to wait and every thought that you have is just hands in your head for so long and semifinals and qualities is just pam 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 five minutes in five out you the only thing you need to focus on is to recover in the five minutes that you have between the bolts mm. 
and finals gives you a lot more time to think, which I really don't like. <laughs> oh, I get that. Yeah, like the dark thoughts seep in, and you just go in circles. Yeah, which yeah, which requires then a different kind of like mental strength. Sometimes I've had finals where I've held my concentration perfectly well, and usually at these comps I did really well also in finals. Um, but as soon as it goes dark, it's like never a good finals for me. Um, but yeah, also this amount of rounds and the tiredness um, makes you more susceptible to these negative thoughts. Um, but I think I've learned a lot of tactics uh, and they work, I think, better and better when I win finals. But sometimes, sometimes you just don't have the energy for it. But yeah, that's, that's part of the game. But um, it's also something that I'd like to work on a little bit more as well. Um, to be like to stay tough until the end like in Laval this is what I did on the last comp I feel like I managed to keep it cool even though I was really nervous maybe the most nervous ever <laughs> but I could I could keep it cool and stay on track until the end yeah yeah what kind of like mental tactics do you use to stay focused I I it also has a lot to do with music, with what kind of music, like dancing also, or just some kind of jumping, like staying lightly physically active and kind of pumped up and and reminding myself of my qualities, of my like being confident, staying confident. Um, deep breaths usually help me a lot to, to calm down and not be too pumped, but also not too nervous. Mm. But usually it is just turning inwards, clearing the head, and just breathe. Ooh, I would love to see climbers playlists for staying focused in ISO. You should yeah, share that. Change. That would be so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, it's all like in material MP3 files that we download somehow. <laughs> well, if you ever have time create a spotify playlist share it out i'm sure people will be very interested to see yeah okay yeah <laughs> um and so when it comes to um viewers watching um semis and finals people always talk about setting and height a lot um and you are one of the taller competitors um which i love because i'm technically a little bit taller and i feel like everyone i know is super short so it just doesn't work for me um, how often does your height come into play for you when it comes to route setting? There was a time, I think two years ago, where it was in my head all the time, where I saw myself being too tall in every boulder. But in the last two years, since it's become a problem, um, I've found ways like to work it out. And I've trained a lot, the, the weakness and I need to find a different body position or I need to make my body work a little bit differently than the others do. Um, yeah, it's it's mostly difficult if it's really feet in your head, sort of like stuff like this. Usually in slabs, they try to make you put your foot next to your face, um, which for me then creates a massive lever. And then... It's, it's hard to get out of certain positions and to try to stay in balance or like the path that you need to take is way longer. So it's details, but it, it it's something that can be worked on. But the problem with it is that it takes so much longer. And then sometimes the adaptability is a bit more difficult. But now, yeah, it's it's working better and better, I must say. The most disappointing thing is when I see that it's harder for me because I'm taller and I try to accept it as it is and then I work through it and I like just brainstorm and see and like trial and error, see what works. And then someone comes, oh, yeah, but it's so much harder for you. You're so much taller. And then when someone like really confirms it in my face, I'm like, come on. I'm trying to forget about it. Like, don't give me that attitude. <laughs> like, I know, right? So when you hear it that often, it gets in your head. But um, I haven't had this experience as much um, 
in the last couple of months or like this like the second part of the season um yeah so it's it's better and i, I think also the root setters are probably a bit more aware of it since um it was talked about a little bit more and i've raised this issue a couple of times so when testing all sorts of heights are trying to do a boulder and then they see if it's possible or not but it's always going to be some things will be easier for taller and harder for shorter and vice versa it's it's inevitable but now the, the idea is to make it really possible and as fair as possible for everyone for every body type um i think it's it's quite quite okay now. Yeah, do you think there's one that's like being taller or shorter that's more of an advantage or disadvantage? Because a lot of comments, it's very easy to tell when being too short is difficult because they just like can't reach it or it's like they have to jump a lot further. And so that's what all the comments kind of um, start to get geared towards. And yeah, it's is it is there more of a disadvantage being shorter? Nowadays, I don't think so anymore. Um, also, being jumpy is something you can train. And while well, making yourself smaller is something that you can train a little bit. <laughs> I would say it's impossible, but it's way more difficult because there's often a lot of stress in the back, um, in the lower back, when you're, it's basically trying to deadlift all the time, I think. Um, but also with shoulders sometimes but yeah that it requires you to be way more mobile and way stronger in your end points uh, of, of the range of motion but maybe it's a personal thing i felt like training uh jumping was way easier for me than training mobility so um naturally short climbers need to have like this leg power that they can like jump off the ground and basically be able to do dinos um so this is the 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 sort of leg training that uh, climbers like to avoid um so i feel like maybe it's a cultural climbing cultural excuse to not train legs and then they were like oh we're short but we can't reach um but yeah there are certainly a lot of moves where they are way easier for me where i have to jump minimally to reach them where someone needs to do like a full power output but as I said there was a time I think two years ago or even last year where shorter climbers had a massive advantage um, and also bouldering was used to be a thing for taller people so if you were short you had nothing to do in bouldering the lead was your discipline and this was a thing like back yeah 2012 till 2000, maybe 18. Um, so everyone was just really tall and they were always off poultry, big moves, jumps. Let's just see as far as we can go. But in female category, the last two to three years, there were a lot of good, but very, very short climbers. Like the best climbers are just really short now. Everyone's around one meter 60. Um, and it's really insane to me. I just can't believe this is happening, but it's like a shift, a massive shift happened. And now everyone's suddenly much shorter, like on average. Um, so, of course, then the setting kind of adapted, um, putting us taller people on a little bit of a downside. But I think this season it was way more balanced out because people got aware of it. So I think now it's it's quite okay. Interesting. So you could like feel the difference as the years passed. Yeah, there were years, or maybe maybe I improved. I don't know, but there were less situations where I couldn't move because something was too close. Please excuse this brief intermission, but I would just like to remind you that if you are enjoying this podcast, please follow and rate it on your preferred listening platform. If you're watching on YouTube, I would love to hear your discussion and thoughts in the comments below. Anything helps to push this podcast out to more people and get even more amazing guests on. Back to the show. This is kind of a detour, but I just wanted to ask about your commentating of World Cups as well. Well, while we're on the topic of World Cups. Um, I only recently learned that co-commentators get paid now. 
um, and you've done it quite a bit. I mean, I guess you probably also did it before you would get paid to do it. So what kind yes. of drew you to, yeah, what kind of drew you to commentating and do you have interest in doing it more in the future? I feel like I've done it way more often before it was paid than now when it's paid. Um, <laughs> so no, I didn't make a fortune out of it. Um, yeah, com co commentators are paid 100 euros per round. Um, and I think it was a strategy probably to encourage uh, people and maybe as a possible yeah, career option like further on. For me, I I brought got brought into it by uh, Charlie Bosco back in the day. I think the first time I co-commentated was 2016 maybe. I can't remember if it was Arco, probably Arco or Paris, the world champs. One of those two. And... Um, yeah, I hit it off pretty well with Charlie, and he really liked inviting me also to the come through box, and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and then when Matt took over, we also got an amazing like vibe together in the come through box. Really, um, it just worked pretty well from the start. And as I already had some experience before, um, but nowadays, um, if I don't make finals. Sometimes I feel a bit too tired to do the commentating and I feel like I'd rather watch than commentate, whereas before it was kind of vice versa. Um, and I did, I think, more lead comp uh, commentaries than Boulder. Um, as in lead, it's, it's a, bit, a little bit less dynamic, so I kind of prefer to talk to someone while I watch it. Uh, whereas in bouldering, um, it's a little bit more intense and... Um, also, I usually am pretty, pretty tired uh, if I don't like, or even if I'm in the finals, I'm tired. So <laughs> it's it's a pretty intense uh, competition. So I usually, yeah, either I watch it there on the spot or sometimes I stay in my hotel room and watch the stream because I don't feel mm, yeah, lively enough to, to go and watch it in, in person or I don't want to mix with people and stuff. So. Depends, but um, yeah, commentary is fun. Um, it was uh, interesting to start doing it when the Eurosport take o took over, because you get like I've probably Matt also explained you get like different clues, uh, and you can hear when there is like this cut time when you have to stop talking and stuff. Uh, I was a little bit afraid prior to my first Eurosport commentary, uh, but then I got into it quite well. So I think. Uh, I think it was, it was pretty good after that when I figured out how it works. But yeah, I don't know. Um, it could be a potential thing to do after the climbing career. I don't know if I'd... I don't know if that position will change. Because um, in a way, I feel like maybe having athletes co-commentate is not the best thing because I feel like you'd want to have a professional do it. Um so that there are two professional co like commentators and not athletes because, yeah, sometimes you're going to have good co-commentary, sometimes not. Um, and to have it sort of balanced, I feel like it's better to have a professional one. And I, I know a lot of athletes who share that opinion. Um, so maybe it will become a thing where former athletes will become, like will form a base for which they will be then hired to do the commentary. Um, because they have nothing to do with the competition then um, personally uh, it's just that that job and if you take athletes there's always like the emotions of everything that's connected to the performance and so on so um, it's a little bit different and probably more subjective when you have athletes but people seem to like that and like that input and to explain what's happening because Probably people don't know much of what's happening, yeah, behind the scenes, uh, behind the wall and so on. So I think it could be a potential career spot for like former athletes or for someone who is deciding to do just that um, and that it will move on from having athletes to it. So that could be an option for for far future for me, I think. I mean, sure, I'll probably... Yeah, I, I mean it, it's a it's an option. <laughs> There's a lot of options, 
but um, yeah, as I said, I really like working with Matt. Um, so that's also why it's fun. Mm. Yeah. I think a lot of people would hope that you would go back to commentating. I think you're a lot of people's favorite co-commentator. So <laughs> people want to see it. Are there any like embarrassing moments that you can think of when it comes to commentary for you? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> there were often there were some phrases and Matt didn't even want to tell me what I said, but apparently I'd say something that could um, give hints towards a sexual other sexual meaning and that I would totally not notice it and then would just go on live. I think once the worst was <laughs> what's the one I remember was when I was explaining why sometimes people choose to do heel hooks and some ch choose to do toe hooks. And <laughs> they said and some people are heel hookers and the others are toe hookers. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. And I realized that as soon as I said it, I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> that was a dick giver. And I don't know what else happened today. Something happened in cult that I can't remember what it was, but we both got so confused. And then there was the queue time and uh, this like silent time. Um, and I don't know, there was like, we said it was like a technical incident, but something happened or I said something that Matt like started to like stop me, prevent me from saying something. I don't, I don't remember what it was. But then we just kind of tried to get the sentence completed. <laughs> and uh, then the cue time came in and we were both like, oh, what was going on? <laughs> it's, yeah, stuff like that, but not that much. Yeah. Okay. No, that's that's good. I don't remember hearing that. Um, do you know which comp that might have been with the hooker talk? <laughs> Maybe it was Chamonix last year. I can't remember. <laughs> it was some lead comp. Uh, if I have time, I'll dig through or try to find but it. Either, like, I think I did last year, I did Coper and, and Chamonix. So one of those, I think maybe it was Coper last year. Uh, it's hard to, hard to remember, but yeah, the, um, so embarrassing. And then apparently when I said, when I told Matt, like, oh, did you hear what I said? What a stupid thing to do. Oh, you said something way worse. And I'm like, what did I say? I'm not going to tell. So I was like, yes, no. You didn't look back and try to find what it was? No, no, I don't look back. I, I don't think I've ever listened to any commentary of mine, except if I wanted to see a certain part of the video, but oh uh, yeah. Okay. I'll try to find it. If I can find it, I'll link it and we can all take a listen. Everyone will Relive see it. what I said. Oh, yeah. yeah. So let's move on to stuff about um, funding and you being a one person team. Um, so there is no Serbian team, I guess. Um, you are kind of the entire team. So how does that kind of work? Well, well, there is a team. It exists. It is me and there are other members of the team, but they do not go to competitions that often. They visit one or two per year, perhaps. Mm, the ones that are international, close by. or yes, yes, international. Um, uh, either European Cups or World Cup in the nearby vicinity um, of the city where the people live in. But uh, usually, most of the time. Um, it is just me and my parents. Um, so my dad is the head coach and my mom is a physio. So we've done this our whole life, basically. So we just keep doing it. Um, so the funding comes mm, through like a personal program by the Olympic Committee of Serbia and also um, through the Ministry of Sports um, as like an elite athlete um, and these two organizations have basically supported a good part of my career and they made possible um, to travel abroad and to travel to other continents mostly um, because this were like the US and um, East Asia were usually the furthest ones to get to and the most expensive ones so um, 
there's also good support from the from the federation from the national climbing federation as well um but yeah their budget is not as big as the the other two i've mentioned before so they jump in when there's a need for it but it's good to to leave the rest of the budget for other kids who are competing and then for potentially other seniors that want to um take part in a competition and then for other things that the federation needs to do but uh, yeah without the olympic committee and the ministry of sport i probably wouldn't be wouldn't be able to to travel far and that often um yeah I, this is what keeps me uh, going and of course this is also related to results so if you have good results you get awarded for the next year mm. So I need to perform. If I don't perform or it's less than a certain position, then it's less money and so on. So there's always some kind of pressure, but also not that much because the people that work with me from these organizations are very, very kind, very supportive. Um, and it, it's really nice to have such contact with these people and, and to feel supported, to feel like belonging because yeah as you said there is no team there is a team but it's not big and i'm the only competitor so i don't have this kind of company usually from the same uh nation from the same team so it's it's nice to have this kind of support and like the sense of belonging to an organization to a team to a bigger team in the sense like the olympic team certainly um to, to to have that behind my like to, to support me to lift me up uh when it's even when it's good times and when it's bad times it's really it's a lovely lovely group of people and um I'm happy to have that in my life yeah oh okay so that's like other just like the Olympic team of Serbia in general yeah so the, it's like the National Olympic Committee that has uh, funding projects um for teams and individuals who um uh, are like prospects for Olympic Games um, and are in Olympic sports and they uh, then fund, like they create the early programs and so on. Um, and uh, there are people who then follow your results, follow you, uh, contact you often, support you and so on. And it's like when I say the Olympic team of Serbia, I mean also all the athletes who compete in the Olympic disciplines, former Olympians, hopefully future Olympians and so on. Um, and it, it creates this kind of this sense of, of unity um, with the others as well. Uh, sometimes we have like some stuff to do together, or like photo shoots, or certain activities, um, or we visit the sports fair, and then there's this committee stand, and then a lot of people from this team come that are involved in any kind of like uh, program with uh, the Olympic committee. Oh. And yeah, it's a, it's a very, very nice thing to do. And this is also one of my biggest um, reasons why I want to go to the Olympic Games because I want to be like also in person, in competition, I want to be a part of that team. I want to be there with my whole nation. Like with all the athletes who compete at the Olympics, I just want to be with them, you know, and and experience that, uh, at, at, that at that kind of event. So. That really, really motivates me. I don't think anyone has any confusion why people would be motivated to be in the Olympics. That'd be a yeah, pretty I mean, they're cool different. Dream. Yeah, there, there are different things about Olympics that motivate people. Like someone just wants to be the Olympic winner, you know, or you just want to be a part of the experience. But this like nation connected uh, uh, um, reason is really, I think, one of the few biggest things about it that I like. Yeah. And so I guess specifically, I'm not sure what the climbing scene is like in Serbia. Um, I mean, you don't currently live there. So I'm assuming maybe the gym scene there is not as built out or there's just like um, more access to like coaches and setters in Germany. Um, what resources do you feel like you have access to and what do you wish you had access to? But yeah, Serbia sadly is still not following the the trends as it would be expected in 
2023 now still <clears throat> um it is it has massively developed um thankfully and uh, there are a lot of people who climb and a lot of people climb outdoors too i feel like this elite scene is more on the side of the rock climbing um whereas the beginner and like commercial climbing is of course more popular uh, in their bouldering in their bouldering gyms there have been quite a few openings especially in belgrade and also in niche we have a new wall since um a year or more than a year um which is great and i finally have like a really really good place to train when i go home and i'm really really happy to have that um because when i was a kid it was not even close to the conditions that uh, now exist in my hometown. But yeah, there is not enough coaches, not enough root setters. Even though there is obviously work being done in this uh, area, we bring foreign um, specialists and they hold seminars in Serbia, they teach people. Um, I still believe that it more work should be done but it's also like we don't have enough people in it that have been there for a long time to be able to gain this knowledge um and experience so it's all fairly new so to say but uh, yeah i i lived in slovenia from 2014 until 2019 and i was there for schooling and also for training and then I enrolled in the master's program into 2019 in September, October, and in Munich. So I'm, I'm still here. And uh, yeah, here I have like a little base in Munich and uh, a lot of um, neighboring cities that have amazing gyms and uh, really good route setting that I can access. So it's maybe currently for me in this part of Europe, yeah, for me, the perfect spot to be in. Um, and of course, it will require some traveling to Austria, further down south, back to Slovenia also, and to France for some training camps. But now I feel like I'm very, very central. You know, I have a lot of opportunities in the nearest cities around me. Yeah. And so back to the financial portion. Um, I think climbing has always been a very collaborative sport. People are always reading routes together, helping each other out in ISO, like you had mentioned, um, even though it's like a competition. And now that there's more like money and fame tied to it with the Olympics, do you are you like concerned that's something that's going to change or go away? I'm afraid it will, but maybe not that fast. Um, I think it's a kind of an advantage to have both old school people in climbing and the new school people in climbing to keep the balance kind of going so that the sport doesn't go fully commercial and forget its, um, yeah, roots, so to say, the culture and so on. Um, it might happen uh, sooner or later, but um, so far it's been quite all right. It hasn't. It hasn't had too much of bad influence, but also there hasn't really been, I think, enough, enough financial like inflow to the athletes. Um, I feel like we all need a bit better sponsoring <laughs> contracts than we, than than the than the companies can well afford. This is a it's like a vicious circle. The outdoor companies don't have enough money because they're outdoor companies, and they can't give a lot of their budget for a lot of people and then the athletes don't earn enough from from the sponsors uh, because it's still considered to be an urban slash outdoor sport which is not <laughs> like competition climbing sorry has nothing to do with being urban or yeah outdoor um uh, yeah but sadly it all still runs in a kind of a different world so there will not that many mm, sponsorships that come outside of climbing. There are some, but a bit more nowadays, but still not as much as it should be for an Olympic sport. Uh, 
but yeah, so far, like what when it comes to like interpersonal um, rel- relationships and contacts, I think it's still quite all right and quite like as it was. Maybe there are some new kids coming in who are new to the world and uh, see it from different perspective and are, have come in the time and place where it has become way more com- commercial and um, this is the world they know. So, uh, like the difference sometimes is is, is noticeable, uh, like with ambitions or maybe, um, yeah, how you show yourself to the world. But yeah, not not such drastic differences really yet. Hopefully, it'll still be um, a nice environment to be in. Yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so looking back on the um, 2023 season, um, I think you mentioned it was not the best season for you. Um, Now that you've had a little bit of time to reflect on it, how are you feeling about it? Still bad? Lowlights? Highlights? Yeah, I think when we talked last time, it was still quite fresh from the end of the season. But now when I look back, really, I, I just can see how much progress I've made. Um, it was a really chaotic season because it was so many competitions on different parts of the world in such a short period of time that, yeah, people needed to skip comps. You needed to, like, be tactical about it. And it was <clears throat> pretty pretty hard to endure it all. But in the end, yeah, I mean, I had pretty great results. Like I had a bronze in Brixen and uh, this silver on the European qualifier, which was probably, yeah, the performance of the year for me. I was so like flowy and and, and really strong and um, both mentally and physically. So um, I felt that I really peaked at the end, (laughs) so to say. yeah, there were a lot of like unfortunate moments, of course, but um, it was just, it was a process. So the last competition of the year was the most important anyways. So everything before that was kind of the path towards it. So um, even though I missed out on the Olympic ticket for just one spot, well, again now for the second time, I I don't think it was bad still. I think it was it was a pretty great experience for me. Um, a good introduction to know what is it, what's the format going to look like at the OQS, like in terms of the amount of days, the amount of rounds, rests, and so on. Um, pretty exhausting though, but uh, now I know what it is, so it's, it doesn't come as a surprise uh, at the OQS. But yeah, all in all, it was all right. It was all right. I think it was it was good. It was uh, a lot of positives, uh, a lot of learning how to deal with myself, approaching problems, people. I realized, actually, I thought that this new generation of people are just really closed in their own bubble and nobody wants to communicate and nobody reaches out, nobody approaches. And I thought, well, nobody approaches me. Like, what's up with all these people? You know, like the people that I know, of course, I have no relationship with. So, but every time that there's like someone new um, and they seem to like communicate like within their own small circles, I thought, yeah, that, I don't know, everyone's getting too proud or so so other. But then I've heard that I'm probably not the most approachable person either. And then when I started approaching people, myself, as a already much well, experienced, I won't say old, but experienced in the in the comp scene, when I started approaching the kids and like talking to them, like being the, the first one to break the ass, then I would figure out how like many of them are like just really nice and kind people and and this spread of kindness was something that really motivated me and motivated me on a few comps. Just being there and seeing how nice people are was really cool um, because I've judged it otherwise before as I didn't have the full picture. And when you don't talk to someone, you well, you don't know who they are and what they do. You just see them compete and 
how they behave. So that was very inspiring to to have this sense of a community again. Yeah, that, that's just pretty nice. That's one of the biggest takeouts of this year as well, I think. Uh, that Well, yeah, sadly, I have to do the work and the approaching, but it's worth it then. No, I think that makes sense. I mean, they're younger. They probably like have watched you climb and are probably fans as well. And when you're a fan of someone, it's very, 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 very scary to approach someone and try to talk. Yeah, to I've heard that someone, some people were scared of me also, I think. I think Brooke said that. I think Brooke was really terrified the first year or something like that. I think she went through her mom and I know her mom since I was a kid. Uh, <laughs> and, um, well, Brooke was, I think, still around there, but we didn't know each other and she was really a toddler back then. And um, I've I've approached uh, Robin in Arco, I think 2008, maybe. It was a really a long time ago. And um, my parents used to have uh, these VHS uh, videos of her training, um, like, yeah, training movies of, of Robin, Robert to Eversville, Robert to <laughs> And they were really big fans. So they were like, oh, let's get like to know, let's get to know each other, let's let's greet her, blah, blah, blah. And then we met. And uh, it, was, it was really lovely. I mean, I didn't watch his videos, I was really tiny. So <laughs> what did I know? But apparently, my, my parents said that she's really a big climber, you know? So I was like, okay, let me meet someone like that. And well, she was really lovely, you know? And, um, she remembered me from then and then we always greet each other in every competition and she watched me grow up basically and then Brooke came into uh, World Cups and she, was like, she told her, mom Stash is really scary <laughs> she just like started laughing because Robin doesn't know me being scary you know and she's like oh Brooke it's fine she's actually really nice <laughs> that's funny you know it's good to know that other competitors also get really scared. It's just it's just scary talking to people. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Is there anyone that you're uh, that you're scared to talk to? I don't know. Maybe I don't know if it's really fear. I don't know if I'm scared, but it's definitely not on the same level. Like. Uh, Adam Andra, perhaps. Um, he doesn't visit competitions that often. Um, so I don't get to interact with him almost at all. I don't know if we've spoken a few words even uh, a few times, but it always feels like he's someone very big who, you know, did big things and then I'm just hanging around. <laughs> that's a little bit how it feels but uh, everyone else I really I know for a long time now so it's not a big deal anymore but Andre is not around that often so I think it's mostly it and it's just such a big name you know that yeah when you're not used to someone uh, like that it's, it's funny because also maybe People would feel like this with Yana as well, but with Yana it's like completely the opposite because I've trained with her when we were teenagers. Um, so I, I know her for a long time since she was 14, basically. Um, so we're, we're really, we're really good friends and uh, yeah, that, that's, there's a quite the, the opposite side of it. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Well, I hope you can um, meet him one day, have a nice chat. Maybe, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> um, so yeah, back to the 2023 season, you were also juggling university and getting your master's degree along with the season. Um, so how did you manage that? I had to give up on some free time activities, firstly. Like I play viola um, and I played in some amateur orchestra here in Munich. And uh, I realized that I've, yeah, I need to finish uni um, this summer and that I don't have enough time. So I had to give up uh, playing viola in the orchestra and maybe, yeah, so like reduce the social activity. But um, yeah, I spend a lot of time on my computer while traveling, um, just working for the thesis. I started 
yeah, beginning of January. And um, I, yeah, can recall working a lot while being on some tour somewhere in the competitions. And I had the thesis handing on the day of the Chamonix qualifications. So it was, it was tiring. I found it very hard to keep the concentration up with the volume of, of climbing. It's like when, when I'm done with the training, I'm so low on energy that I can't focus. So this was a little bit tricky to handle, but I found, managed to find some kind of a rhythm, how and when to do it. I was more productive if I worked in the morning and then went to training than vice versa. Or I had to like wait till the this initial tiredness phase away and then in the evening I could be way more productive. I just bumped into the computer. Um yeah, but um it went well and I, I finished. I, I graduated, so now I'm not a student anymore. Thanks <laughs> for a few months now. And I still feel like I don't have time to do everything that I want to do. It's like it's it's always like that. It doesn't matter how many things I have to do. I never have enough time. Maybe <laughs> you should just do everything anyway, and it'll still just feel like you don't have enough time, but you're doing more. Yeah, I think that's 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 more of a solution, but n not doing more in the sense doing more stressful things, doing more things that I like. So I like, I like programming, I like researching, I like writing. Um, and now... When I don't do that, I probably do more other activities that take my time, but I don't have the benefit of it. Like, I don't know, binge watching, probably. Mm. And uh, maybe also trying to pack in to meet all the people in one day if I can. And then I stress out when I get late to like every consecutive meeting. Or now yeah, I just pop up a million things in my schedule and then... I stress out to finish them all on time and then to be able to catch this and that and that. And I somehow managed to schedule a lot of traveling as well. So everything that I couldn't do during the season, now I'm visiting those places and people. So yeah, I feel like I spend half a month maybe in my flat and the other half somewhere else. <laughs> um, a lot of traveling at the moment, so yeah. What are you binge watching? Oh, now I'm City Movies in Pirates of the Caribbean. So I have two more. And then uh, Big Bang Theory also. Interesting choices. Yes. Uh, I always thought, yeah, I always thought a Big Bang Theory was annoying. But now that I've rewatched it, I haven't watched everything before, but now I just started from a season and I just go on in the eternity. Um, now I find it pretty funny. So Yeah, people started memeing on that show a lot because they would like take out the laugh track and then it would be like not funny at all. But yeah, it'll ruin it for you. So don't watch those. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I'll try because I still think some, some things are pretty funny but it's just a good thing i've never noticed that how it would be without the laughing without the audio it might ruin it so maybe you don't <laughs> do it okay and then you have to you have to watch the spin-off show as well um young sheldon wait i forget what it's called oh, I there's did a spin-off yes yeah, oh, you watched so it. i watched yeah so i watched the big bang theory a while ago when it was still on tv like airing uh, back in the day but only when i'd catch it and i I think also why I didn't find it so funny is because I watched it with like Serbian subtitles at back in the day. So maybe the translations were odd and then I usually focus more on the text than on what I hear. I'm more like visual person, like my audio understanding is behind my visual uh, comprehension. So maybe this is why it wasn't so funny. And then I, I started watching Young Sheldon maybe at the beginning of this year or like maybe during the summer. Uh, and then I watched the whole of it. And I, how it started, I saw some shorts, like some inserts on YouTube. 
which I found super funny. And I thought, oh, maybe this show is really cool. And then I watched the whole Young Sheldon. And then I was like, oh, well, now I have to watch Big Bang Theory. <laughs> and that's, oh, okay. that's how it went. <laughs> yeah. Should I watch it? Is it good? Which one? The Young Sheldon. Sheldon. Young Sheldon. I've I, never seen that. Yeah, I find the, the rest of the family funnier than the actual Sheldon. Um, so if you want, like, really funny Texas-speaking people, then it's good. It's good. It's pretty funny. Okay. I'll <laughs> give it a watch. Yeah. Thanks for the recommendation. Yeah. It's, like, so Texas-y and so, like, traditionally from that state uh yeah also the behavior like the the, the vibes in the sound it's pretty fun <laughs> okay i'll see um and you also i didn't know that you were still playing viola up until like before this season um is that something you're gonna pick back up it's a thing that i put down and pick back up every now and then like in seasons i did uh Six years of musical school. Um, I started a little bit late also, so I had to like run through the like so-called elementary music school that last six years, but I did it in four. Uh, like I had to do two years in one year twice, um, stuff like that. Uh, and then I enrolled in the high school. I did years one and two, but then when I moved to Slovenia in my third year of high school, um, stopped like the music education but I continued playing in the school orchestra <clears throat> where I was so yeah then when I enrolled in uni this is where I stopped basically in the bachelor's and then yeah picked it up every now and then replayed some old stuff maybe if I found something new I'd play that and then left it again and then picked it up again so yeah I think I'll pick it up again soon I I have some stuff on the place. I haven't touched my violin since I started climbing, really, but I imagine the strings might kind of hurt on my fingertips. Depends. Depends how you play, because for me, it's more like above the the fingertip uh, ones, so to say. So... Depends. The sliding, like switching positions, can sometimes be painful, and the third finger mostly because I kind of landed flat. But the first two are fine. Um, so it's usually the third finger that is sometimes uh, a little bit more difficult. But I mostly find it painful if you have like capsule uh, injuries or like any kind of actual finger oh, injury. Really? Some positions are really painful. I, I had it once or twice. Um, yeah, especially going to the last string, like turning over is hard sometimes. Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. You know, I'm going to try it. With... You should get back to it. Of course. I'm going to try it today, <laughs> right after this. <laughs> nice. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. And we should. Uh, good. Thanks. I've been inspired. <laughs> I'm glad to are here. Okay. Um, oh my gosh, we're running out of time. I just want to ask really quick about um, OQS preparation, and then we'll do a few Discord questions, and then I'll let you go. Um, so yeah, OQS, um, can you just briefly explain how OQS is going to work for people who aren't as familiar? It's a very confusing process, honestly. <laughs> like the whole Olympic qualifications are very confusing. Um, so OQS consists of two competitions. One is in Shanghai, in May, and the other one is in Budapest in June. So it will be run just as all the Olympic qual continental qualifiers, basically the same system. So you have qualifications, semifinals, and finals. Um, and then it's in both disciplines, it's in combined. So qualifications, first qualification boulder, then qualification lead. Then they sum up the points, Take the 20 people, 20 people go to semifinals. And then the same, both semifinals, lead semifinals, sum up the points, take the eight people, and then it's finals. And that's the same. So at the end of each event, you have your ranking one, one, two, 48. There will be 48 people there. 
each of these places get a certain number of points. It's like ranking points, nothing to do with climbing points. So just to denote the certain place that you hold after a competition. That's all. So the same is done in Budapest. And then they will sum up these points. The ranking points will be summed up. It's basically like a general ranking in the end. Uh, and the top 10 in the general ranking go to the Olympic Games. But top 10, as long as the conditions are fulfilled, maximum two spots per country. Um, and then also if one French person or female French is in top 10, since they already have one spot and they have one host spot, they don't count in this one. So the 11th person also goes instead of this. So yeah, the Fr France already has a spot, but just they're allowed to send their athletes because host spot is the last one that is like filled up or given to one person. Therefore, they have the right to go to OQS and, well, maybe use that event as um, a way to choose who the person will be for the whole spot. I don't know. Uh, so they are allowed to send their athletes, but if they're in top 10, then they don't count in this whole scope. So yeah, you have two per country, so that means there's one more Japanese. So if there are three Japanese in top 10, only the first one counts, just two fall out and then you pick up people and so on. And also there's some trick with the universality, like this Olympic solidarity spot. I think Svana needs to be top 35 from what I've heard on that comp to be able to go to the Olympics. If she doesn't make it, then also one more spot goes from no QS. I think this is also where I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, it's top 10, but with a limit. Gotcha. Yeah. And so how is your mental game going into OQS? It's it's pretty well now because it's still the beginning of the the training. It's still like basic training, basic build up. <clears throat> um yeah, base endurance, base power. That's um there's not much complex stuff going on yet. Um not that many um like more comp specific things to be trained right now. It's all physical bases. So yeah, I mean, mentally it's just going through it and giving your all. Um, it's just about like finding those like physical limits and then pushing through. Um, this is that, that that's like the part of the, the preparation now. And then in the following months, it's going to change and develop into more technical, more specific more demanding things. No. Doing anything special to prepare? Or? The usual. It's a lot of fitnessing, a lot of mm, spray wall climbing, like a lot of repetitions, circuit training, stuff like that. All right. And also, like the OQS competitions are happening quite close to the actual date of the Olympics. Um, so, does that affect anything? Like, does it make it more stressful because then you have to, like, peak at different times yeah it is a bit tricky because you technically have to peak twice but I feel like qualifying is pretty important so I'd I'd rather peak, peak soon as well um, I'd rather go to the Olympics and run than not go so I feel like there is no playing with this with LQS it's, it's really going to be tough um so it has to be top top form for both of those comps to, like, to try to hold it hold on to it and of course world cups kind of lost their sense now <laughs> and this year um but yeah i think it's also oculus is an amazing preparation for the olympics so it still gives you um a month and a half um, to to recover and prepare, which is quite okay. Um, but I think it should have been organized a little bit earlier because our idea was when we talked about it in the Athens Commission was to have it 
like March, April, May latest, but then it all shifted and everything got postponed. So that's me and Jude's. That's a little bit unfortunate, but yeah, it is what it is and gives us still enough time to prepare. Are you planning on taking part in any of the World Cups before that? I don't even know if they put out the schedule, actually. Yeah, there is a schedule. So I'll go to Shanghai for the World Cup in the beginning of April. And also two weeks later is like a European Cup in Klagenfurt in Austria. So these are the two comps I'll do before. Then it's Shanghai, okay. So we go to Shanghai, come back, and then go to Shanghai again. <laughs> um, and... Between the two, I will not be doing any competitions. Makes sense. Well, we are looking forward to seeing you compete in the World Cups and really praying for you for OQS. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. We want to see it happen. Good luck to you. Yeah, me too. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And so, okay, a few Discord questions um, from the community. Um, so first one, you're very expressive with your emotions on stage. Do you ever get negative responses to that? And does it negatively impact you? <laughs> well, I think it affects me negatively when I have negative emotional responses, <laughs> but it's, it's who I am and it's how I've always been. So this was one of the bigger, like long-term projects of mine to try to, um, kind of calm it down a bit, not in the sense of restricting myself of emotional expressiveness, but rather um, to control the negative side if it comes. There were times, I think, three two years ago when I was really getting pretty angry um, at myself, like for making mistakes and stuff, but it's, it's always like a few layers down. It's like accepting of yourself and your mistakes and starting over and... Um, a lot of the things I never thought I'd have to deal with, but as you grow up, sometimes you mm, forget how you were when you were younger, when you didn't have such like mental responses. So then you actually put work in and, and yeah, change, rewire yourself and your way of thinking. Because as you grow up, you change and your brain changes and your thoughts as well. So there was, um, also good progress on that um, this year, but I don't know if I get negative comments. Mostly, I think friends and family would point out to me sometimes, but mm, mostly people like that I'm that expressive. I think it's good. And, uh, uh, photographers like it a lot because they don't like it was completely not expressive. They hate it. They have nothing to shoot then. Like, I've heard these complaints so much. <laughs> They're like, ah. Oh, you're the easiest to shoot. There's always going to, something's going to come up, you know? <laughs> no, yeah, it definitely makes it more interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, any noticeable differences in how each national team trains since you've kind of been around? Yeah, it does. Actually, you can see the patterns of what the base training consists of and how they do their plannings. Like so far, I had experience with um, like a combination of yeah, what the Swiss used to do, the Austrians used to do, the Slovenians and so on. And it all has a similar idea, but like slightly different approaches in like number of moves, number of repetitions, um, how many times per week what, when you do which exercise. It's mostly, mostly to differ in what particular exercise for a certain thing. So this is where I found the most... Um, variation but it's usually just in the and the base training like this what happens in winter um but it, it follows a similar uh way of thinking yeah is it like are you gonna do i don't know four by four or three by six or are you gonna do eight moves or ten moves are you gonna do it with weight no weight and so on there's stuff like that do you have like a favorite national team training plan no. And the perfect one would be a combo of, of all of those, like just picking bits and pieces from my Okay. Um, one person said, I lived in Munich for quite some time. What do you like about the city or about Germany in general? I like Munich because it's so hmm, nice and orderly. 
there are people that don't like this at all about Munich, but for me, it all looks hmm, kind of peaceful, so to say, not too chaotic. Um, and it has just some really nice landscapes and nice spots in the city, like a lot of nice parks as well. Um, quite like pretty buildings, or like nice architecture. Um, and each part of the city has kind of a different vibe. And I fell in love with Munich when I started coming here for the World Cups, basically. And uh, it was always like, ah, oh, I want to live here one day. <laughs> Um, I also said about Stockholm, but I still haven't lived there. I think the weather there is a bit too much for me. Here, it's still like a lot of nice sunny days, but also a lot of rainy days, which I didn't know was a thing in Munich. But, um, just, that was a little bit disappointing, but okay. <laughs> There's a lot of rainy days here too. I mean, everything in like that European area is a bit, can get a bit gloomy. Yeah, it depends. I think mm, everything south of Austria gets a little bit more sun. Yeah. Mm, I don't know. But I'd miss some mountains around here. I am, it's pretty flat around Munich. So I have to drive for like an hour or two to get to the first mountains. Um, usually when I drive to Innsbruck, which is two hours away, that's where I get the most beautiful mountain views. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, Germany is it's an interesting country. Sometimes it's too orderly, unnecessarily orderly. Sometimes I like to, the order, um, depends on which field. But I'd, I also have a lot of international friends here, which will, makes it like more colorful, so to say, or um, doesn't make it feel too, too German. Most of my friends are climbers, but also from from different different countries um and we all live here for a while and found our ways how to fit into the community here and uh, people like in the lifestyle here so yeah i feel like i've found a nice way of living here as an american saying that it's a two-hour drive to get to innsbruck is completely insane <laughs> yeah uh, yeah that's I, not I, long at all for me yeah, for me, a day trip is two, two and a half hours, maximum. Two and a half is still, I'll think about if I'll do a day trip. But yeah, nah. so yeah, to Augsburg, I have one hour. To Nuremberg, I have almost two hours. Innsbruck, two hours. Jeez. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's <laughs> Switzerland, different. Like T Ticino is, yeah, Ticino is like four and a half or five hours max. Yeah. Wow, yeah. And still don't go there enough. <laughs> I did a uh, a nine hour drive two days ago to get back from Vegas to San Diego. So it shouldn't usually take that long. There was just a lot of traffic, but I'm like I'm broken physically and mentally from that. I I don't drive to Serbia. Like I can't commit to an eleven twelve hour drive. I cannot do it. It's a lot. So, it's yeah. awful. Yeah. So yeah. Don't do it. Yeah. Um, okay. This was a comment that someone really needed you to know. Uh, they said in the 2022 season, um, you were co-hosting for Elite Finals. Yonya ended up topping the route before she clipped. Um, she waved. And you asked her why she waved when you were interviewing her. And this person really liked that. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> because as a friend seeing her do that, I was like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Clip first, wave second. <laughs> no, the funny thing is that like sometimes I just yeah, I know that's stupid thing sometimes. And um uh, like not not really stupid, but rather clumsy things. She used to be really clumsy oh, but, really? a bit younger. Yeah. Like she would when she falls for bowlers, she would really often land on her face. I don't know how, but yeah, you probably see it in cups. <laughs> and I think like she told me recently that she started hearing me in her mind when she's about to do something stupid. <laughs> she hears my voice telling her, "Come on, just do this thing." I think it was in bed in the like semifinals, and there was like a tricky slap, 
and I watched her and I she was hesitating so much on the last move. She was stood there for I don't know, maybe 20 seconds. I don't know. Or it felt like eternity to me. And I just held my head and I was like, what are you doing? Just stand up. And she was like trying to go and stop and go. And I was holding my head and I wasn't even close to her. And after that, I saw her, I heard your voice in my head telling me, oh, come on, Yana, just stand up, you know? <laughs> I was like, well, I'm proud I'm in your head. <laughs> it's like such decisive moments, you know? <laughs> yeah, that means a lot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last question. Um, are there any outdoor boulders and projects that you're currently interested in or working on? Mm, yes. There is just one that I'm like very interested in. The other is I've kind of lost myself in finding proper projects, so to say, because I also haven't spent much time outdoors uh, either. And I found only one that really attracts me, but it's also really, really hard. So it's a very long, long-term project. So it's the big island, the 18 font. Um, every time I'm in front, I go and play around on it. I find it really fun to play around and I'm doing the um, original beta um, OG Dave Graham. I span it out. Um, I still miss one move. But the rest of basically done and worked on is just about like connecting sequences. I've done quite some good project progress um, now this autumn after after Laval. I had one good session there. Um, but yeah, other than that, nothing that I've really tried that I've devoted myself to so much. There's a couple of things in Frank and Jura, like I don't know, we wrote a leader with father and son, soft eight C or like eight B plus eight C, which is almost always wet. And the biggest, the hardest part of this crux is not to slip off the holds and to to kind of over grip. And it was really cold when I tried last time. It was too humid, so I, I didn't manage. So yeah, I'd like to do that one. Um just because the fact that being wet is the crux. It's just a little bit annoying, and I just want to get it done. It's a nice route, really nice route, but this is like a very unpredictable thing. <laughs> but yeah, these two currently, and yeah, there'll be probably maybe more if I start like devoting my time to actual projecting. I guess you probably won't have a chance this season before OQS. Probably not. Uh, and I'm honestly also not interested in it. Um, it, I've, I put so much focus on the OQS preparation that I feel like if I go outdoors, it's going to feel wrong. And so far, I've been always, I've always been the person who needs the balance of both. I crave outdoor climbing in nature to to be able to train properly uh, afterwards. But now, yeah, this is probably the first New Year's that I'm not doing any outdoor climbing. Like no. I plan no climbing trips. Maybe I'll go somewhere for a weekend because Frankenure is close and maybe drop by Silatal or something. But uh, yeah, that's no, no trips. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. You've got to stay focused on OQS and we want to see you make it to the Olympics. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's all the questions I had. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, is there anything you want to shout out or let people know where they can find you? Um, yeah, you can mostly find me on Instagram. Um, I'm bad with replying, but I, I think I read and open every message. So I'm really grateful to everyone who texts and uh, expresses their support in any way. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, that's the way to go. Uh, other social media platforms I'm not really on. So yeah, Instagram is the one, I think. <laughs> okay. And I'll leave the link down below. All right. Well, thank you so much. It was amazing to talk to you. Yeah, you too, Judy. Thanks. Those uh, good questions also. Oh, thanks. Very nice. 
I try. Thank you so much for making it to the end of the podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed. Otherwise, you are a super fake climber. If you're listening on a podcasting platform, I'd appreciate if you rate it five stars and you can continue the discussion on the free competition climbing discord linked in the description. Thanks again for listening.